Gaming Bolt presents the 15 biggest unanswered questions in the entire Metal Gear series. The Metal Gear franchise has been at the top of the gaming pantheon ever since its humble beginnings on the MSX in 1987. Since then, the series has grown exponentially, crossing horizons we never dreamt possible, telling riveting stories, capturing the imaginations of millions, and setting incredibly high standards in almost everything it does. But the one aspect that has consistently been the underlying strength of the series throughout these three decades has been its convoluted and complex narrative. We're not here to claim the story of Metal Gear is flawless, though. It would be foolish to suggest it is. Anyone who has any sort of familiarity with the series knows of its tendencies to go off the rails and into the outlandish and bizarre all too often. As such, a lot of things in the series have often been left unexplained, a lot of questions unanswered. Here in this feature, we're going to take a look at what we feel are 15 of the biggest questions that the Metal Gear series has left unanswered. If you disagree with any of our picks or feel there are other burning questions we failed to mention, sound off in the comment section below. Be warned, there are major, major spoilers for the entire Metal Gear series ahead. Solid Snake and Solidus If you're well versed with the story of the Metal Gear Solid games, you know that Solidus Snake was designed as a sort of perfect clone of the legendary soldier Big Boss. This meant that Solidus Snake, even in appearance, took after his genetic father a great deal. Up until the tanker incident in Metal Gear Solid 2, Solidus was also the President of the United States, which meant that Solid Snake surely would have seen his face at least on TV, if not up close. So why is it that Solid Snake never recognized the resemblance Solidus' face bore to Big Boss, his own old mentor and the man he had fought against so many times and even supposedly killed? And another related question would be why did all of the hostages during the Big Shell incident never look at Solidus, their captor, and go, hey, isn't that the former president of the United States over there? Where was Solidus during the Phantom Pain? Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain's primary purpose in the chronology of the Metal Gear saga is to serve as a sort of bridge between Peace Walker and the original Metal Gear, and as such, it features appearances from a number of characters who function as major players in the series. From Psycho Mantis and Colonel Volgan to Huey Emmerich and Liquid Snake, they're all in there. But notably enough, the game never makes mention of Solidus Snake, the third and ultimate product of the Le Enfant Terrible, pardon my French, project. The omission is a little surprising, doubly so if you take into account how, in some capacity, the Phantom Pain actually dedicates significant time to Liquid Snake and the cloning project itself. Where was Gray Fox during the Phantom Pain? Speaking of major characters that have never made an appearance during the events of Metal Gear Solid V, where was Gray Fox during all of this? Gray Fox is one of Big Boss's most trusted lieutenants, so a lot of people were expecting him to play a major part in the Phantom Pain story especially given where the game is placed in the series' chronology. If you consider portable ops as canon, then Frank Yeager and Big Boss have already met by the time the Phantom Pain begins. And if you don't, shouldn't the game have given us a canonical account of how these two characters crossed paths? Code Talker's Warning About Kaz Code Talker may have been newly introduced to the Metal Gear mythos with the most recently released game in the series, but his character is also a very interesting one. One of his most intriguing scenes arrives in Chapter 2 of The Phantom Pain. It begins with him muttering some gibberish about a message from the Parasites, and then going on to say, Eyes on Kazuhira Miller. What does this mean? Well, that's just the thing. The game never follows up on this. You'd expect it would, but this is just one of those many loose ends The Phantom Pain doesn't resolve. Does Code Talker know about Kaz's communications with Zero? Or maybe he just found out he's embezzling money from the Diamond Dogs for a burger joint. We can speculate, but we'll never know for sure. Diamond Dogs After the Phantom Pain After the events of the Phantom Pain, we know that Big Boss merges Diamond Dogs into Outer Haven, but that is just something we've always assumed because it's the only logical thing that could have happened. It's a bummer that the series never really explains how that happened. By the time the Phantom Pain ended, Diamond Dog's mother base was massive, housing numerous facilities and hundreds of soldiers, and even having its own Metal Gear, not to mention nuclear capabilities. It was a veritable fortress in and of itself, so maybe spending some time on showing just how Big Boss and his followers merge all of this with Outer Haven wouldn't have been such a bad idea. Volume 1 and Volume 2 Tapes Cassette tapes were a major, major part of Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes and The Phantom Pain. 
Rather than having the same heavy-handed, exposition-heavy storytelling style he had employed in all other Metal Gear games with almost feature-length cutscenes, Kojima chose instead to delegate a great deal of hugely significant narrative segments and story revelations to tape recordings, which players may or may not come across and then subsequently may or may not choose to listen to. One such tape found in Ground Zeroes was the curiously titled Volume 2 tape, which was essentially just sounds of broken signal and static. A lot of fans have speculated that this could be a coded message, though the real question should be, if there is a Volume 2, then there has to be a Volume 1, right? Could it be the tape that Venom Snake listens to at the end of The Phantom Pain, the one sent by Big Boss? Is that Volume 1? Seems like a logical conclusion, but what does that mean about the contents of Volume 2's tape? Is it instructions from Big Boss to Venom Snake about Operation Intrude in 313? Is it something else? The questions remain unanswered. Ocelot and the Legacy Metal Gear Solid 3 is perhaps one of the most significant games for the story of the entire franchise, not least because it tells the origins of the Patriots and how they were, in a way, the successors to the Philosophers. Thanks to the massive pile of money known as the Philosopher's Legacy, Major Zero and his followers were able to form the Patriots, and most of the game's story focuses on the attempts of various groups trying to get their hands on it. By the time the game ends, one half of the Legacy is supposedly with the CIA, while the other is with Ocelot. But how exactly is it with Ocelot? It's explained that one half of the Legacy was given to the Russians, so how is it that Ocelot managed to get his hands on that half? Where was the build-up to that? What steps were taken by the people involved to get to that point? The Boss and Ocelot Metal Gear Solid 3 was a game that was brimming with massive twists and reveals, and while it's easy to get lost in the swamp of global conspiracy theories and triple agents, we shouldn't forget about some of the more character-specific revelations as well. Ocelot, also known as the man who dramatically points at stuff, was revealed to be the child of the boss and her now-dead lover, the Sorrow. As big as this revelation was, we never really got to spend much time with it. Does Ocelot know that he's the son of the leader of the Cobra unit? Conversely, does the boss know that the child she gave birth to while she was undercover on a mission so many years ago is the same man she's working with? Ocelot was, after all, taken away by the philosophers right after his birth, so it stands to reason that the shadowy group may have tried to hide his origins from anyone and everyone they could. But given how much time the two spent working together in Metal Gear Solid 3, both on and off the screen, is it possible that they eventually discover just how the two of them were connected? Where was Eva between Metal Gear Solid 3 and 4? Few characters have had as much an impact with as little actual screen time in the Metal Gear series as Eva. She was introduced as a major character in Metal Gear Solid 3 as Naked Snake or Big Boss's love interest, and she came back for the game that followed, Metal Gear Solid 4, for another major role in the narrative. Though she made two consecutive appearances in the series, her appearances were actually separated by a lot of years in the chronology. Metal Gear Solid 3 is the first game in the franchise's timeline, while Metal Gear Solid 4 is the last. So where was Eva in the time that elapsed between the two games? We know thanks to Metal Gear Solid 4 that she was always working behind the scenes to fight against the Patriots, and that she was also heavily involved in some major developments like the Le Enfant Terrible project. So why is it that we never saw her or heard of her in any of the actual games that were released after Metal Gear Solid 4? Peace Walker, Ground Zeroes, and are all centered around Big Boss. So wouldn't it have made sense to have her actually involved in some capacity? Big Boss rejoining Foxhound The revelation Eva made at the end of Metal Gear Solid 3 was a major one, not only because of what it revealed about the boss and her true mission, but also because it drove the man who would go on to be known as Big Boss away from the Special Forces Black Ops group known as Foxhound. And yet, after years spent as a mercenary and the leader of his own private armies, at the beginning of the original Metal Gear, we once again find Big Boss in charge of Foxhound. While we can easily interpret that doing so may have been part of his master plan, understanding the mechanics behind it is a lot harder. How was Big Boss able to once again make it into the inner circle of the United States secret agencies, especially given his history during the events of Peace Walker and the Phantom Pain? How did he make contact with Zero again? How and why did he take him into confidence again? Questions such as these are easy once you start reading between the lines, but it can be argued that they were important enough in the first place to be answered directly by the series itself. Oilix 
Metal Gear Solid 2 has to be the most frequently overlooked game among all of the numbered entries. Though it had a lot of important moments and portrayed some significant events, there was a lot in it that was either just a retread of its predecessor or was ultimately inconsequential to the overarching narrative of the entire franchise. One such thing was Oilix, an alternative source for fuel developed by Dr. Keo Marv made from algae or something to that effect. And as anyone who's played Metal Gear Solid 2 will know, Dr. Marv only had one single cartridge containing the Oilix data. But how the heck does that even make sense? Oilix was a major, major breakthrough discovery that could have had worldwide implications in countless ways. So why did he only make one copy of the data? Also, why was it never brought up again? For instance, why did the Patriots never try to get their hands on the old data in order to expand their control over something as vital as a source for fuel? Metal Gear Rex the Metal Gear Rex vs. Metal Gear Ray battle of the Guns of the Patriots has to be among the best scenes this franchise has ever given us. It was a moment of pure fan service, of two massive nuclear tanks squaring off against each other in a battle of brothers, a culmination of dramatic and outlandish storytelling in an equally dramatic and outlandish scene. But once you get past the fanatic hysteria, and we understand that that is easier said than done, you start to realize that the scene shouldn't have existed in the first place. In fact, Neither should have the entire plotline about Snake going back to Shadow Moses nine years later. The Shadow Moses incident was a well-documented and publicized one, one that was even covered by the media. So why was it that the nuclear-capable walking megatank was left unattended on the island for all of those years? Did no one, not the government, not the countless secret agencies, and not even the Patriots, seem to think that recovering it might pay off in the future somehow? How did the Patriots AI give orders to people? Metal Gear Solid 4 may have been the game that revealed the origins and the ultimate goals of the Patriots, but it was with Metal Gear Solid 2 that we learned just what exactly the shadowy organization was all about. Sons of Liberty was instrumental in terms of setting up the Illuminati-like organizations, showing just how much power and control they had over almost everything, from the media to even the presidential elections of the United States. The question, though, is... How exactly did all of that come to fruition? By the time Metal Gear Solid 2's story begins, the Patriots have successfully turned into a fully automated system of AIs. So how exactly do the Patriots contact their followers? How do they convey instructions? How do they rig something as huge as presidential elections? How do they constantly keep in touch with the president and all of their other more important pawns? After all, it's just a system of AIs, right? And if all of these people received their instructions through their nanomachines, then how and with whom did the process of installing those begin in the first place? What happens behind the scenes? We know these are questions that can be answered through deductions and assumptions, but it would have been better if the series had made an effort to explain all of this stuff in detail itself. The Patriots and Liquid Ocelot Who in the Metal Gear universe isn't just sick of Ocelot? We're pretty sure the characters existing within the franchise despise him as much as fans adore him. He's been a thorn in the sides of almost every major player on the global scale since the events of Metal Gear Solid 3, and he really came into his troublesome best as Liquid Ocelot in Guns of the Patriots. Taking advantage of the war economy that had been established by the Patriots, Liquid acquired five of the biggest private militaries in the world, essentially making himself the most powerful man and terrorist on the planet. But why did the Patriots allow that to happen in the first place? They're a network of artificial intelligences. So why, knowing everything about the histories of both Liquid and Ocelot, did they allow him to gain as much power as he did? Why was he not taken out of the equation as soon as he arrived on the scene? Covering up the Arsenal Gear Crash The ending of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty was quite a dramatic one. Even if you choose to ignore the climactic duel between Raiden and Solidus, and the discovery Snake makes about the Patriots and purely look at it as a set piece. It still has to be one of the most ambitious things the series has ever done. Solidus's warship Arsenal Gear crashes into the banks of New York City, tumbling through the streets of Lower Manhattan. It leaves in its wake a trail of destruction, destroying a large part of the city before finally stopping in front of Federal Hall. It is, as you can imagine, a hugely public incident. How, then, do the Patriots manage to cover it up, and the truth of the actual events surrounding it and leading up to it? Sure, the Patriots are an extremely powerful organization with reach and power in almost every walk of life, but an incident as devastating and as public as this surely just couldn't be swept under the rug, right? 
And that'll be about it for this one. If you guys like what we're doing at Gaming Vault, please consider subscribing to our channel, and I'll see you guys on the next video.